what would be sort of the, the main thing you'd say uh, perhaps for some people, even if it's like the US but overseas, how do you convince them to sort of Network. say, yeah. I'm an Aussie but I'm, I'm good to go? Networking. I know it's, I mean, you guys practice it as, as much as anybody and preach it as much as anybody. It is genuinely the way I got in my door into Hong Kong and it's my way I got my door into um, or knocked on the door and got into um, the US. I created a spreadsheet. You know, I went on LinkedIn and I had this template that I had that I could reach out to people and it wasn't just, hey, copy and paste. I'd look at their profile, look at, hey, where they worked, what their experience was and I'd tailor the message to their experience. Can you tell me more? Everyone had a bit more time. Now, what I always did is made sure I worked for them. So 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, all the things I always said to them was, hey, I explained my ambition, but I just wanted to get to know more about them. And that wasn't from a place to benefit myself. It was more so just to actually hear people's stories because I found it really interesting. Then it got to a point where I remember I was heading over to the U.S. for a, um, a conference. And I said, hey, you know, it's, it's serious enough that you're waking up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Let's make it even more serious. Let's go see them in person. And I was literally flying every single day for about 20 days. I went to different places all, wow. all around the US because for me, I'm like, hey, you know, you know I'm serious when I'm waking up at 2 a.m., but you're even more serious once I'm having a coffee with you in front of you. Um, so for me, I think it's just that mentality of being relentless. G'day guys, coming up on the show today is E-Ray Saban. If you thought working in sport was all fun and games, well, E-Ray's role will show you that some jobs in sport are literally a matter of life and death. E-Ray is the Assistant General Manager of ASM Jacksonville and the Director of Everbank Stadium, home to the Jacksonville Jaguars, where his job is to make sure every single attendee has a safe and enjoyable experience. E-Ray's previous roles include Event Operations Manager at Kai Tax Sports Park in Hong Kong, Stadium Event Manager at Marvel Stadium in Melbourne, and Events Operation Coordinator at Tennis Australia. Lots to look out for, including how to break into the US sports industry, skills needed to manage large scale events, and how to effectively manage and lead. Let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grab podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker. Joining me is the big conference guy, Reuben Williams. We had two mates who met at Cricket Australia back in the day and each week we learn how people made it in sports. We tease out their career decisions, work habits, skills and everything they do that makes them great. Also that you can learn how to get in, get promoted and get thriving in the sports industry. Big conference guy, Rubes. How are you? G'day, Ryan. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Traditionally, before we go to a conference or a meetup, we get a haircut of sort the, <laughs> the conference cut, we like to call it. Yeah. Uh, mine came about two weeks ago. I think yours yeah. is looking pretty fresh though. It was Friday. Yeah. So a couple of days before. Yep. Got uh, the conference, yeah. conference, conference cut. cut in. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Had to look good. Yes. Uh, but you're right, we've just been at Sport NXT for a couple of days, which is uh, seems to be the conference that every single person in Australia descends upon, particularly yeah. when you're at that, you know, exec or, or CEO level, which, you know, if you work for yourself, you can appoint yourself to that position. Yeah. So we went along naturally. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we're yeah. going to go along. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was amazing. Uh, I think I put out a, a post on LinkedIn after the event that I felt like I was walking through my LinkedIn feed. Mm. It was just all the people that I see in the sports industry in Australia descend on one place so you, you walk down the corridor and you see all the people that pop up and like yeah. your posts and post it themselves so it was very cool to see everyone in the one spot yeah i agree it was uh you know we we see a lot of people on linkedin see them over socials whatever um and seeing them in the flesh is just so much different mm. it's great um and yeah like i put on linkedin this morning like it's just good to sort of you can just sort of take 10 minutes on the side and just have a chat to someone mm. you know we saw a few podcast guests there obviously um, I, f I feel like they were just running around everywhere. There everywhere, were so many yeah. of them. It kind of <laughs> reminded me of how many episodes we've done. Yep. But, you know, like guys like Andrew Ryan who live mm. in Switzerland, mm. like we never get to see them in person. Uh, and just being able to get him for a couple of moments and just chatting about what he's up to and, you know, what's coming up and sharing a little bit about what, what we're doing, um, it was awesome. Mm. And, and seeing old colleagues as well, I yeah. think uh, – there was a moment there we were having uh, – it was a bit of a break in, uh, break in play and I think there was probably 10 
ex-CA, including some CA guys that were already there, um, all together. It was just kind of good seeing old colleagues again, and which mm. you don't really see. So it's, 100%. Um, it was un- unbelievable. Yeah, the uh, yeah. the Cricket Australia network is really spread far and wide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, big time. Good for us. Yeah. ERA on the show today, super mm. exciting. Um, I used to think when you talk about working in sports that it was just like, let's put on a footy game, let's make sure the cricketers have got everything they need and, you know, yep. entertain but then after talking to E Ray, and when he mentioned things like we've got the FBI at our disposal, the bomb squads nearby, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, he's talking about people getting king hit on the concourse and, you know, how, yeah. how he deals with that. That's when I suddenly like sat up after yeah. 276 episodes of doing this podcast and realized, like, my God, like, sport actually is a matter of life and death sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more than just the, you know, the ball being thrown around on, uh, for the Jacksonville Jaguars, there's a lot more to it. And uh, you're right, when you mentioned like the National Guards there and the FBI, I was yeah. like, whoa, okay. Uh, it's not just about the little ball on the field. It's uh, it's a lot more than that. So, mm. yeah, unbelievable. And round two for E-Ray. He round goes to the Hall, Hall of Fame. Yeah. I would have thought. Yeah. I think if you get a double episode, you, you're in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. We were very lucky to catch him. Yeah. He, he, he said to us that he was only in Australia very briefly. <laughs> And in, you know you, you know what it's like when you're popping back into town and you know hundreds of people and everyone wants your attention. Yeah. Sometimes it's best to just, you know, slip in, slip out. So we were very lucky to get his time yeah. given the amount of people that he could have spent his brief time in Melbourne with. So we're very grateful for yeah. that. And I think you, you might have mentioned that, you know, outside of the show. He was like, yeah, I'm, I'm coming in. I'm not, I'm not telling everybody I'm here. Uh, <laughs> we so. might have just exposed him now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. right? He's, he's gone now, so it doesn't matter. It's yeah. All good. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were very lucky to get an hour of his time to uh, – to yarn at what he's been up to and we've obviously been following his journey um, mm. ever since we, we first met him. But, um, mm. yeah, again, good seeing him in person. He's incredible. I'm pretty sure he's only 31 and he's yeah, the director I'll, of an NFL stadium. I was thinking that mm. and uh, he'd be listening to this obviously. So, <laughs> you, yeah, he, he seems more wise than his age. Yes. You know, I think that's a I think nice ven- thing to say. Venue it? management will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see some stuff after a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Sorry. But I was chatting to Kerry Gasner at the end of the conference yesterday. So Star. Kerry is a venue manager of John Kane Arena in Melbourne, also been on the podcast in episode 206, I believe. And he knows um, uh, E-Ray very well and just had such nice things to say about yeah. how well he's doing too. So yeah. This is going to be a terrific episode for those tuning in. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get cracking. But before we do, uh, a bit of a member update. There's plenty happening as always. Absolutely. Plenty going on in the Sports Code community. First off, let's start with our wins. Mm. We've got some big ones this week. Daniel Cavallo just got a job as HR employee experience lead at Mojo Sports. Well done to you, Dan. Nice. Jane Churchill, operational support corner at the New South Wales Office of Sport. Well done to you, wow. Jane. Big uh, government role. Yeah. And uh, Darian Hyde, program coordinator at Whittlesea Pacers Basketball Club. So well done to you, Darian, as well. As always, there's plenty of events coming up tonight. When this episode goes out, the 25th of March, we have a Rookie Speed Networking Night. Pro Speed Networking Night is coming up for our professionals on April 11. And we've also got a masterclass this Thursday with uh, Michael Bricknell, all about sports law. So if you uh, mm-hmm. want to brush up on your contracts and understand the legal side of behind sports, Michael Bricknell is going to walk us through that. And then, as always, Coffee Club every Friday. But the biggest news of all is we have a date for our next intake. The date is set. The date is set. So if you've been waiting to become a sports grad member at a rookie level, then Tuesday, May 14 is when you need to set your calendar for going to be open for 48 hours, Tuesday, Wednesday. You've got two days to jump in and then we're closed for another three months. May might seem like a long time away right now. And if you miss those two days, it's going to be a long time until August or September when we do it again. It's not so, far away, is it? No, that's right. So if you are looking to break into the sports industry, sports grant membership is the fastest way to do so. And uh, May 14 is uh, the day to look out for. If you are already working in the sports industry and you're a pro, um, you're a young professional, first 10 years of your career, you want to mix with like-minded people and grow your network in sport, then apply to become a pro member as well. It's the quickest way to grow your network. Otherwise, if you want to stay up to date with absolutely everything that's going on, newsletters where it's at, sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's a link in our show notes to join. Brilliant. There's so much happening. May 14, put it in the calendar. Yep. Set a reminder on your phone. Yep. It's a big day for everyone. 
All righty, let's get cracking. Grab a pen, enjoy this chat with E. Ray Saban. E. Ray, it's good to have you back on the pod. Welcome. Thanks for having me, boys. It's good to be back. Welcome back to the country. First time back on the pod since I think 2020 we had you in. And um, people always ask us like, how do you get your guests, where they come from, when you find them? Sometimes we get recommendations, but for you, our sliding doors moment was uh, on a Movember webinar. That's and right. um, we had a bit to do with Movember at the time and they sent us an invite to jump to this webinar and you were the speaker. And uh, after you finished speaking, I just shot your message on LinkedIn and said, hey, that was great. And then uh, we went from there. A few weeks later, you came on the podcast. Now, a couple of years later, you've, you've been around the world and now you're in Cremorne with us. So welcome. Oh, thank you. And you know what? Now that you say that, I completely forgot about that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it is. It's, it's, uh, it was, uh, I remember that message and yeah, by all means, really, really happy to be here. Awesome, mate. I don't think we did the quick fire questions when we had Ira on the first time. No, it wasn't a thing at the time. Uh, things have changed a little bit around here. The structure's changed a little oh, bit. Oh, look out. Uh, <laughs> look out. <laughs> some super scary quick fire questions. Yeah. Uh, so what we do is just get a few questions from you just to let our listeners know exactly who you are and what you're about. They're lucky because a lot of our uh, loyal members, well, listeners, sorry, would have uh, heard your first episode. Yeah. But these are some questions that get to know you a little bit better. So first time, what was your first ever job? I think it was McDonald's, I think, McDonald's. And nice. I think it was for about three or four hours. And I remember I had a, uh, a manager that was a little bit aggressive, so I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> not going to put up with that. <laughs> no, I just said, no, enough's enough. You're not going to speak to me like that. My parents don't even speak to me like that. And, you know, I was stubborn and egotistical at the time. But, yeah, that was one of my first ones. Nice. Love that. Yeah. And what did you do at university? I studied a uh, Bachelor's of Business with an event management major. And your favourite sporting moment? I think I put down, yeah. The uh, the Essendon 2000 grand final, I think it was. I think I put that one down and as, as the greatest. And, um, you know, I was still young at the time, but, you know, when you're an Essendon fan, you've got to clutch at straws, you know, <laughs> yeah. 24 years on, we're still waiting for that moment again. So <laughs> it's, it's a good, good time what, to be living overseas for Essendon fans. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Time yeah. zones uh, makes it hard to follow the pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what's your favourite interview question to ask of candidates? Um, I think it's just anything that sort of um, gets to understand what they're like as a person outside of work. So, well, you know, what would their closest friends or family say about them? It's not necessarily always how people operate in a professional environment. It's how they operate when, you know, they can be them, their true selves as well. Uh, any books or podcasts that's helped you at work? <laughs> my my favourite book, look, I've, I've got to get better at, at reading books, but um, I still remember the subtle art of not giving a F. Um, and, and what I learnt from that book is not just because I sometimes have some loose lips, it's um, just truly what it, what it taught me in terms of how to operate as a person as well. So that would probably definitely be my number one um, podcast. I just don't have necessarily always the patience all the time, aside from obviously sports grad. Yeah, um, yeah I just I struggle a little bit. So being able to pick something up and put it down at my own leisure is, is a good thing. Love it. And uh, one platform that you use at work that you couldn't live without? Which is a tough one here. I think just in general, I use LinkedIn a hell of a lot. Um, it seems crazy that it's not necessarily work related, but it is because you build your network and you're then able to, you know, bounce off the people as well. Um, and then using those those connections to understand what other buildings are doing with things and um, how you can sort of tailor it to, to meet your needs as well and just connect with people in general. So I'd definitely say, although probably a non-traditional platform at work, definitely LinkedIn for sure. Nice. LinkedIn would be happy with us saying that. <laughs> yeah, get us uh, a plug and give yeah. them my commission later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and last one, if you had 30 minutes to pick anyone's brain, who would it be? Tom Brady. Nice. And and that's just purely, you know, he's one of the greatest of all times in obviously the NFL, but um, I think for me it's just what he does off the park as well. Um, you know, you see that he's just signed, a, I think it's a 10-year, $380 million um, you know, Fox Sports, I think it is, special commentary. That, but he's doing so much more as a businessman. You know, TB12, I think, just got picked up the other day as well. So um, just understanding how to operate off the park as well as, as on it as well, I think he's really, really cool. Did you go back into the country in time to see him up in Brisbane? No, 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 no. no. Did you hear about his life I heard show? about it. I watched it. I mm. watched it. A couple of highlights on Instagram and stuff like that. And, you know, him throwing a ball at Volkanovski as well from the UFC. <laughs> yeah. Like, he just... I mean, he filled out the room in, I think it was Brisbane and Melbourne, right? So mm. he's just done incredible things, which I think is just, yeah, a testament to him as a human being. Yep, that would have been a good one to be at. Hopefully he's doing a few Jacksonville games <laughs> in the next couple of years. 
fingers crossed they've got to start performing again, which I'm yeah. sure they will. I have zero doubt. So, um, yeah, he'll be um, in Jacksonville and, and I look forward to that moment. Amazing. Well, let, let's dive into what you're up to at the moment. You are the director of Everbank Stadium, home of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, um, and you work, fall under the ASM Global banner Correct. as well. Can you quickly explain who are ASM Global and then tell us a bit about your role as director? Yeah, so ASM Global is pretty much the world's leading venue management company. So they've got about 350 buildings worldwide. Wow. Um, they span from everywhere in Australia to Asia to Europe um, and then obviously predominantly a lot in the US as well. Um, we run seven NFL buildings, which is pretty insane. Um, we are moving towards a, a tendency where um, a lot of uh, NFL teams want to run their own buildings, but ASM Global is doing really incredible things to hold on to those contracts as well. And um, I think just from their level of professionalism, expert network um, of being able to just be in contact with so many other buildings to see what's happening globally, um, they do such ph phenomenal things. Um, and uh, yeah, my role pretty much spans to everything that's involved with, with the stadium. So um, as stadium director, I oversee pretty much everything um, involved in everything from managing the relationship with the Jags, um, managing and helping to manage the relationship with the city of Jacksonville, um, but then overseeing everything from parking, um, you know, turf management, major events, um, operations, pretty much anything that's in the building, you know, you've got, you've got your finger on the pulse with it all as well. So, you know, it's painted with a, a broad brush. Um, you know, you've got to have your finger sort of doubling in all of it, but not an expert of all of it and, and really grateful to have a, you know, sensational team that really lead the charge and I'm there more for the mentorship and just to, you know, put the finishing touches on a, on a fantastic cake is the way I sort of explain it. How do you go about managing those relationships as an Australian in the US? <laughs> do they ever look at you like, what do you know about <laughs> NFL? What do you know about... <laughs> Florida. You know, I am, I'm so grateful. I think everybody um, in the city of Jacksonville has welcomed me with open hands. And I say that honestly and openly. And, um, you know, it was a little bit rough at the start. Um, I still remember, um, you know, Americans and Australians say things a little bit differently, <laughs> right? And I remember one of my team meetings, I, uh, I, I opened and I started talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars. But in, in the US, it's the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jaguars. They say Jaguars. <laughs> so I remember I, I looking at my team, there's probably 30, 30 people in the room and they're all looking at me like blankly staring at me. <laughs> and nobody like had the courage to sort of say anything, not courage, but they didn't want to offend me. And they came back and I remember one of them, my parking manager, he came up to me, he's like, he got to a point, he's like, what do you say? Are you saying like Jaguar Vein? And I'm like, no, <laughs> the, the Jags. And he's like, oh, it explains so much more now. So my next team meeting, I opened up with that and I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to just stay the Jags now moving <laughs> forward. But um, no, they, um, they've they been really, really professional across the board. I think what they do really well is that they welcome people from different cultures and, and different backgrounds. And I think one thing I really pride myself is earning the respect as well. So, you know, what we soon... I soon found out was that the fact that we do things really well in Australia. And I think we naturally look to the English Premier League, we look to the National Football League, um, and we sit there and we think that, you know, they are the pinnacle. And they are, don't get me wrong, broadcast right deals, you know, the amount these guys are getting paid, viewerships, all these things, they are fantastic. But when it comes to operating those buildings, we do it really, really well here in Australia. And I think one thing that is easily to be neglected is you think that naturally over in the US, it's so much better. Now there's a certain different level of professionalism, absolutely, but for a lot of those core fundamentals in venue management, it is very, very similar and, and it's a testament to the quality of work that's being put out in Australia. I, I really noticed that as well in, in the last couple of years, particularly one when I was at the FIFA World Cup in Qatar and it took me about 25 minutes to buy a, a bottle of water at, yeah. at half time because hospitality <laughs> staff were serving you know, drinks for the first time in their life. Yeah. And then secondly, when I went to Wimbledon, and yeah. it took me eight hours to get inside. So I had to wait, up, wait in the queue. There you go. And I was like, gee, the MCG gets 100,000 people inside and out very quickly in comparison. Yeah. So exactly. It opened my eyes to how well we're doing here. Exactly right. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, those core fundamentals, everybody wants to get everyone in and out of the building as soon as possible. And we do a really, really good job of it in Australia. And I think we do a great job of it in the US as well. Mm. Um, last time we spoke, you were stadium event manager at Marvel Stadium. Uh, it's been a little bit of time since then. So do you want to give us a bit of a rundown of uh, what's been happening since we last spoke? Yeah, it's been a, uh, a bit of a roller coaster. Um, 
in a positive way, I should say. That, that's a really good roller coaster. Yeah, a, a good roller coaster that, you know, um, you know, if you ask my uh, fiance, well, now wife, Susie, I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit differently, but <laughs> we've, uh, we've, we've, we've moved a little bit around. So we, um, once I was at Marvel, um, I actually got a role in Hong Kong, um, a Kitak sports park with ASM Global. Um, it's a new, if you haven't seen it, for those of you that are venue management or, uh, or stadium nerds, um, it's, it's scheduled to open pretty soon, but it's a three, uh, $3 billion US um, sports park that's opening in the next next year or so. Wow. Um, it's got a, a stadium, 50,000 seat stadium, similar to Marvel with a retractable roof. Um, it's got an arena and it's got a um, public sports ground and then also a whole bunch of retail and, and community sports initiatives. And it's based on the old Kitak sports park, uh, uh, Kitak airport. So they've called it Kitak sports park. Um, so I went there, um, had a fantastic opportunity. Um, a couple of incredible uh, mentors of mine provided me that opportunity in, in John Sharkey, who used to work for ASM Global and, and Leonard, and um, not um, Leonard, um, Paul Sargent, sorry, my mind went blank there, but also supplemented by a gentleman in the US, um, Leonard Bernacci, that really assisted me with guiding me and saying, hey, it's a good career move for you. And I uh, went out there and it was just such an interesting interesting experience um when you look at it so um to to move to hong kong and be engaged in a real interesting culture where you know although it was an english speaking project a lot of people are local um just the career development i had you know was just in, in incredible you know being able to be um fundamentally involved in just being able to manage um you know the the pre-operating uh, uh, pre-opening stage of a, a major sports park was something that was pretty incredible um but you know the goal was always the US and once you bundle in some family decisions as well with my partner, um, an incredible opportunity came up in, in Jacksonville and, you know, I was going to Hong Kong to get to the US eventually now, albeit I'm very much a pedantic one that likes to finish what he started. Um, but, you know, once you have some family um, things that you want to get done as well in terms of progression and timelines move and shift, um, an opportunity came up in the US and I spoke with um, one, of the, one of the main mans out there, Leonard, and I said, hey, I'm really interested in this position and he said, uh, you know, if you want to throw your hat in the ring, go for it and, you know, interviewed for the role and went through all the, the core fundamentals and then ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. So I use the analogy of there's not many different places you can go from Hong Kong in China to Jacksonville, Florida. So it's, <laughs> I think there's much, much more of a place where you could find a, a broader difference. But, yeah, really, really excited to be in Jacksonville at the moment and excited to be back home. But, you know, I do consider Jacksonville home now as well, although mum likes to think otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> So nice. how, how long have you been in Jacksonville for now? Uh, since December 2022, so about 14 months now. Nice. Yes, 14, nice. 15 months. So yeah. it's been pretty cool. It's a, I use it as like a similar place to like Geelong. Um, mm. There's beautiful beaches. It's a, a small community. You know, Geelong's all about the Geelong Cats. Little Jacksonville's all about the Jags. And, um, you know, they're the only professional, you know, professional sports team aside from some semi ones that are coming up, you know, AAA baseball and stuff like that. Um, so the, the culture of the Jags in Jacksonville is mm. just through the roof. They're really, really pedantic and, and love their Jags. It's a, no, <laughs> it's a nice little sort of section there of the US, isn't it? You've got the Dolphins in Miami, you've got Tampa Bay Bucks there and you've got Jacksonville there. It's a nice little bit of a rivalry down there. Do, oh, you, yeah. do, you, do you feel that amongst both teams? Yeah, and, and what people always leave out as well a little bit is you've got the Falcons just above you in Georgia as well, Atlanta, Georgia. So, um, yeah, look, Florida is a, a sporting sporting um, state. Um, it's a beach state, but it's a sporting state. And, yeah, you know, you see people that, you know, it's always been – you've seen the success of obviously um, Tampa and, and, and the rich history with, um, with the Dolphins, but the Jags are up and coming. You know, they're doing some good things and – no, unfortunately, you didn't finish the season the way they probably ideally would have wanted this year. But last year was just unbelievable to have, you know, 70,000 people in the building and, um, you know, beating the Cowboys at home and then also having a, you know, 27 to nothing comeback win um, against the uh, against the Chargers in the home playoff game. I've, I've never been in a building like that that was absolutely heaving mm. um, the way it was. So um, it is a nice little pocket of, of the US and... Um, I can't say I knew too much about Jacksonville until I got there, um, but I'm, I'm grateful that I am there now and, and I'm learning a hell of a lot. Before you came in, I had to look up on Google Maps, where is Jacksonville? <laughs> to get my bearings. North Florida, that's the way you got to remember <laughs> yeah. it, North Florida. But yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a nice pocket. It's a yeah. nice little pocket. And to add to that little sporting hub, the uh, FIFA 2026 headquarters has moved itself into Miami too. So everyone's congregating on Florida. Miami's just, I mean, Jeff Bezos uh, moved there as well. I don't know if you guys saw that too, but Miami yeah. is just 
pumping. Like, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of it's to do with taxes and how it relates compared to the big cities like New yeah. York and those. But yeah, it's it's beautiful weather. Why wouldn't you move there? So, mm. um, Florida is the place to be, and it's it's probably similar. I always use the example as like a, a, a North Queensland. It's very tropical esque, yeah. and you know, it's an easy place to live. Mm. It really, nice. is. Um, can to get your venue management lens on one thing. Ryan and I both know that when you work in sport and you go to a sporting event, you never see the sporting event the same way ever again. In Melbourne over the weekend, Taylor Swift has just sold out three nights in a row at the MCG. 96,000 people are walking through every single night. As a venue manager, what goes through your mind when you think of close to 100,000 people going through a stadium for three consecutive nights? For me, it's it's funny because you naturally can deviate to the worst case scenarios and naturally in venue management, you have to plan for it, whether it's weather, whether it's obviously in the world we're living in at the moment, whether it's counter-terrorism measures or somebody that's operating in a lone wolf environment or is a crowd crush. I mean, obviously we've seen a lot that's happened across the world, um, whether it's the Manchester inquiry and, and then obviously what happened with the um, Astro World thing as well. So um, for me, it's always just about, hey, how do you get them in as quickly and safely as possible? Um, naturally with these tours, I mean, Taylor Swift is arguably the biggest act in the world at the moment. So um, what comes with that is obviously additional security measures that you really want to make sure you really nail down and, and you have the confidence when people are getting in that building that they've been screened efficiently and effectively as well. But, you know, they're not sitting there and, and waiting outside the gate for a long period of time. One thing with the Swifties, um, we did it at Marvel in 2018, um, you naturally have these guys that are probably hanging around a little bit longer or, you know, earlier in the piece in the week. Um, so you want to make sure you're looking after them as well because it's easy to just think about the people that are coming in your building at 5.30 when the gates open. You've got to start thinking about the people that have been queuing up there for a day or so. So whether it's St. John's Ambulance, whether it's toilets and restrooms, whether it's some water, something for them to eat or drink, you really have to look at it quite holistically as well. So I think that's naturally where my head goes is what does it look like um, prior to and then it's obviously leaving. I mean not to get too dark, but the world of venue management these days aren't necessarily looking at, you know, lone wolf attacks happening, you know, inside the building because, you know, people are getting screened. So naturally, you know, somebody to go in there and do something quite malicious is not very unlikely to happen or is, is becoming less likely to happen. It's people hanging out outside your gates as well. So as you've got 98,000 people coming out of the building or 96,000 people coming out of the building, how do you look after them as they walk back to their cars as well? Because they become quite vulnerable then. You know, there's no screening measures anymore. So being able to make sure that you've got you know, adequate resources outside the building at the simultaneous time as well is really important. But for me, everybody just sort of, I think I speak on behalf of venue managers all around the world. As soon as that show starts, you almost just want it to finish just so you can get everybody out and, you know, you embrace that everyone has a good time. But as soon as you've got 96,000 people's hands, um, you know, lives in your hands, you really want to just make sure you get that done and, and move it on, move it on and, and wrap it up. Sounds like it's like, what, 98% risk management. It is. It really is. You know, there's a lot and, you know, fantastic amount of work goes into planning and management. But these days the reality is risk and safety. You know, the, the great shows, yeah, they make the headlines, but God forbid something happens and it's naturally the way the way, way the world goes. There's months and months of inquiries, but it's also months and months of stories because it naturally creates and inflicts fear onto people. So um, it is a, a lot of work in that, but it's I always use the analogy and I think I probably even used this back in 2020. Like, you know, what comes with that is a, a massive amount of positivity too because you got 96,000 people coming into the, the, the stadium, right? No matter where it is, even if it's 20,000 or 15,000, whatever it is, for the next two or three hours, whether they've just broken up with their partner, they've got health concerns, whether they're battling financially, whether they're struggling at the job, they are just entrenched in having a good time. And you see those smiles as they walk out of the building and you sit there saying, this is the best job in the world because you've positively impacted so many people's lives at once. And I don't know too many jobs where you can do that. You know, you see motivational speakers that do it as well, but... I just say venue management is one of those ones where you go, hey, this is a pretty cool job and it's worth all the stress and pressures, that's for sure. Mm. Love that. Nice. Yeah, I, I was like, I was in the stand. I don't know if you know much about this. You would because you deal with the biggest stadiums in the world. But I was in the stand and it was literally shaking. <laughs> and I was like, this is freaking me out. Yeah. Oh, this is scary. <laughs> but like, what, like from a venue management point of view, are you like even looking at that risk factor as well down to that level or is it more just the – the people on the ground and what they're doing. Look, you've got to be cautious of it, but you got to trust the structural integrity of, of the stadium. You know what yeah. I mean? For a lot of these stadiums that you've got, 
experts that have designed and constructed these. So um, they are naturally made to move and shift a little bit as well. And you see with the older ones, like even Everbank Stadium is a little bit of an older stadium as well. And you see that, you know, where it was originally constructed, it's moved a little bit and shifted a little bit. The structural integrity, you know, that gets assessed regularly, you know, so right. there's nothing to really be worried about there. Although it is just the fact that you've got a lot of people jumping up yeah. and down and, <laughs> You know, it's not normal people. I know these Swifties are a little bit different yeah. as well. So that's a unique scenario yeah. in itself. So I was thinking like, in a, you know, in an AFL game, we're not we're not usually all moving in unison and jumping up and down. And yeah. probably, you know, when Collingwood wins a flag, we might get a bit of that, but it's not normal. And I was like, does the MCG deal with this very often? It's the Swifty effect, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Swifty <laughs> effect. Don't let it, don't let it get, it, get it behind you. Yeah. Um, what sort of things would go on behind the scenes that people wouldn't be aware of? Particularly when someone as big as Taylor Swift comes to town, what sort of measures are being put in place that just people would have no idea about? Yeah, it's all the planning. You know, um, you know, Swifty aside, whether it's the NFL, whether it's the AFL, whether it's any artist, to be honest, it's the amount of planning that goes in and overlays, you know, whether it's worst case scenario, whether it's strategic planning, whether it's understanding if there's any current threats, anything that, you know, is actually happening in the market at the moment. It's really just the educational piece of communication. And that's the number one thing I put it down to is you do a whole raft of planning, whether it's with tour security for a, for a concert or if it's NFL security or AFL security. Um, but then all your partners as well. So whether it's Victoria Police here, obviously St. John's Ambulance um, and anybody else involved in the, in the piece over in the US, it's it's really, a, you know, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, all the same sort of players that are all in the room and it's just planning for, you know, how everybody responds and does everybody know their role. So a lot of that stuff happens, you know, in pre-planning meetings months in advance. So um, really the week of it's like almost just fine-tuning everything. How, how did you go moving from Australia, arguably one of the safest countries in the world, to the US where what gets fed to us is, you know, another shooting's gone on and a lot of these are happening in large public areas, sometimes stadiums. How did you feel going into a country where that stuff happens and a stadium where that stuff seems to happen even more? Did that ever cross your mind or...? Yeah, it did. Look, don't get me wrong. I mean, you 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 read the news or watch the news long enough, you're gonna you're gonna pick up and think that that's the norm. What I'd say in the US is Australia's got a population of what 22, 23 million people, whatever it is, right? The US has a population of three hundred and forty million people. There's twenty million people or so in Florida. So when you think about it, the population in Florida is the same as Australia. Mm. You densely populate all of Australia into a one single state. You probably see similar amounts of things. Now, granted, you know the ability to bear arms is a lot more free in, in the US. What I'd say is that initially it did sort of keep in the back of my mind, but then once I realized what, you know, sort of resources you've got at your, your hand, you know, I look at a normal NFL game day, we've got everything to really activate the city of Jacksonville pretty quickly, whether it's, you know, um, bomb squads, whether it's canines, whatever it may be, you do have all those resources, same as you do in Australia as well, to really handle any of those situations too. And these guys are ultimate professionals and you just educate the public. And now what happened obviously at the Super Bowl parade for the Kansas City Chiefs is a real anomaly. You've got to stay prepared. I mean, you see it naturally. These things are happening more and more commonly. Just I think a bit, little bit different is it's not in an effective stadium environment where people are walking through a walkthrough metal detector or so on and so forth. So, um, you know, you always got to stay alert but never too alarmed. Um, but staying alert is always the real pivotal part and, and, and keeping up to speed and educating and communicating with a lot of people. Let's come back to when you got the role in, in the US, obviously. What was that interview process like? I know you mentioned you spoke to a few mentors around how – you know, the role can help your career, but take us through the whole process of how the role got into your hands. Yeah, it was interesting. I, um, again, I think I was, you know, naturally just brought to it because of me sort of being the person I was. A lot of people knew what the dream was and the dream was to work in an NFL building. And um, once this one came online, um, you know, sort of got prompted towards it, looked at it, looked at the PD and thought, hey, I can tick, I can tick a number of those boxes. So, um, spoke to a few mentors. It was in the ASM Global family again. So what was really beneficial is I was already an ASM Global employee, so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but then the interview process looked like, you know, speaking to the general manager, who's now my boss now um, of ASM Jacksonville, um, and then the assistant general manager as well, who's, again, a mentor and a close friend of mine now as well. But then obviously interviewing with the Jags too. And, um, you know, when you're interviewing with an NFL team, you sort of sit there and you're like, hey, this is what I'm ready for. And I remember I was doing it and, um, it was all done virtually and, you know, you just sit there and you're like, I'm, I'm ready for this moment. You know, I know that 
I've worked tirelessly to get here. And it was really that point where we look at the question a little bit earlier where I said, hey, things that I've done in Australia are really transferable and relatable to the US. And I could see it, whether it's nods, whether it's acknowledgement, it was relatable because, yeah, AFL is a little bit different to the NFL, but you now I look at Marvel, we did all the big tours, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, Adele, Ed Sheeran, U2, um, the UFC, biggest UFC attendance ever. Like we do all these big events that we are really relatable. And I think naturally people align to the novelty of Australians as well, you know, and aside from the barrier, which I know Ruben and I have spoken about, <laughs> about just talking and how you talk and, you know, being able to slow down a little bit and educate, um, you know, that was, that was a really, really interesting process. And then the pr biggest process was probably the visa process, which, you know, you have to be really well educated in as well. And I tell that to anybody that, you know, I know we'll speak about it probably a little bit later on, but what does that look like? Really being educated on what it takes for an Australian to move over to the US. And you're like, that's what brings you back to Australia now, that whole visa process. So what, what, what are the sort of steps you need to do to make sure that that's all squeaky clean? Yeah, I, I watch countless seminars and I've got a shout out now. Um, Aussie Recruit is a company that, um, you know, started off in Australia. Now they're in San Francisco and they work with attorneys and um, Amy and, and Jono. Um, they do a fantastic job on educating. I think I've watched probably four or five years worth of monthly seminars on what's happening in the latest trends um, in, in the US and, and how they're handling E3 visas. But that visa process, pretty much the way it works for us is if you've got a, a bachelor's degree in the place that you have a job offer, um, you know, you, you can show that, hey, I've got a specialised occupation. So for me, you know, I had a job offer running a stadium in venue management you know, I've got a bachelor's degree, plus I've got work experience that shows that I'm aligned, plus I'm an Australian citizen. It ticks all the boxes to get over there. So mm. just being educated on that and being able to, you know, educate employers that, hey, you know, I'm capable of doing this. It's not as hard as what you think. Um, you know, give us a look. It, it really, really happens and it happens pretty quickly as well. But it just takes the convincing <laughs> and the education. Was the, the process with the... Um um, with ASM Global and the Jags, uh, did it feel any different to the process in Australia? Like, do they ask different questions? Is there a different mentality around it? Like, what, how do they compare? I think what differentiates, like if we use Marvel as an example, you've got the Saints as a tenant, you've got Essendon as a tenant, you've got Carlton, the Doggies and North Melbourne, right? And then you have, at the time, mm. Melbourne Victory and the Renegades. Your tenants aren't interviewing you. You are interviewing with Marvel and Marvel only with the NFL and obviously with the Jags and their close investment with the stadium, they, you know, it's a different perspective because it's not just the venue management side of things. The team wants to understand a little bit more about you as well and how you're going to benefit them to run their game yeah. day. Um, so I'd say that was the major difference across the board. But, um, you know, the questions are, questions are similar, mm. to be honest. I can't say I remember them all, but, you know, it's, they're, they're really, really similar in understanding mm. who you are as a person, what you bring to the table and, if anything, it, you stand out a little bit more because you are an Australian that's worked internationally that is coming to the US market where when you're in Australia, you are Australian and you are interviewing for an Australian role and Australians are talking to you, do you know what I mean? So it's naturally that differentiation factor where if you can sort of capitalise on that and show that Australians do do things a little bit differently, it can actually work to your benefit. Mm. Mm, nice. Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting. It, it sounds like you know it's different to hear because you know, we're all Australian really and, you know, it's, um, it's not too hard to sort of relate to different people. Mm. But it sounds like over there you're almost trying to convince them to give someone who's a bit different a chance. And seven I, years. Yeah. That's how long it took me to get over there. Seven yeah. years of like, hey, knocking on the door, countless LinkedIn messages, countless wake-ups at 2 a.m., yeah. 3 a.m., like nonstop, relentless, two, two trips on my own, own, on di own dime over there as well, like yeah. knocking on doors just to say, give me a shot. And, mm. um, you know, Leonard Bonacci, who I mentioned earlier as well, he was really the one that said, hey, let's, let's, let's give this a shot. And it does. It, and I think for me, I always look at it as a real in inspirational thing for myself is like, I hope that I can set a standard over in, in the US that encourages others to come over, but other employees to go, hey, these Australians know what they're doing. And, and we should give more of them a shot as well. And it's not that hard to do it. So yeah. I think to your point, yeah, it's, 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 it's a long grind to get there, but yeah. it's definitely beneficial. Because we've got a lot of, a lot of our members who have those ambitions to go overseas. And, you know, we often get the question, you know, how do I best get over there and yeah. how do I best set myself up? What would be sort of the, the main thing you'd say uh, perhaps for some people, even if it's not the US, but overseas, how do you convince them to sort of Network. say... Yeah. I'm an Aussie, but I'm, I'm good to go. 
networking. I know it's, I mean, you guys practice it as, as much as anybody and preach it as much as anybody. It is genuinely the way I got in my door into Hong Kong and it's my way I got my door into, um, or knocked on the door and got into um, the US. Um, I remember I've got a spreadsheet and it was probably peak COVID. I'd, I'd headed over to the US in 2019, interviewed with the Chicago Cubs um, and then came back and I just knew I didn't get that job and I knew, hey, I've got to keep going, got to keep going. And I just thought of COVID. And once COVID stopped and, you know, the world stopped effectively across the board and furloughs and we all talk about what happened across the time then with people being stood down, I created a spreadsheet. You know, I went on LinkedIn and I had this template that I had that I could reach out to people. And it wasn't just, hey, copy and paste. I'd look at their profile, look at, hey, where they worked, what their experience was, and I'd tailor the message to their experience. Can you tell me more? Everyone had a bit more time. Now, what I always did is made sure I worked for them. So 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning, again, Susie, my fiancé, was going crazy because my alarm was going off at all times and she was working still through, through throughout all of COVID. But built out this spreadsheet on when I last contacted somebody, where they were located, what their job role was, and how do I stay in contact? And, you know, all the things I always said to them was, hey, I explained my ambition, but I just wanted to get to know more about them. And that wasn't from a place to benefit myself. It was more so just to actually hear people's stories because I found it really interesting. Now, naturally, over time, keeping those connections and just knocking on the door and, hey, let's catch up again, let's catch up again. The world of, you know, Zoom and Teams and all these things made it so accessible. Then it got to a point where I remember I was heading over to the US for a, um, a conference and I said, hey, you know, it's, it's serious enough that you're waking up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Let's make it even more serious. Let's go see them in person. And I was literally flying every single day for about 20 days. I went to different places all, wow. all around the US because for me, I'm like, hey, you know, you know I'm serious when I'm waking up at 2 a.m., but you're even more serious once I'm having a coffee with you in front of you. Um, so for me, I think it's just that mentality of being relentless and that's what it is. If you want it bad enough, you'll knock on the door. Now, I'm not saying that it's always easy for everybody or financially viable and it wasn't for me even at the time as well, but I made it work is saving all your money and actually getting over there and show them. Go and, and travel and just enjoy the place, but go and see these people in person as well. And I think over time and with everything, once build, building that relationship and that camaraderie with them and them understanding and being able to talk about yourself a little bit more, that's the best way to get your foot back in the door. That is an amazing story and an amazing example of, of how to do it well. Um, you remind me of um, one of our fellow podcast guests, Aman Alawalia, who also had a spreadsheet of who to reach out to, when was the last time he contacted them? And uh, he broke into the Kansas City Chiefs, mm -hmm. went from there to the Brooklyn Nets. Now he's just moved to London with uh, Alpine, the F1 team. Incredible. And um, it's people like yourself and Aman that go to like the absolute heights of the sports industry because you make an effort like this. Sure. Um, I'm glad you brought up that spreadsheet because I've actually just started to create one myself, very similar. That's good. So I use a platform called Notion. Okay. And I've started to build up my own little personal CRM of people I know. Wow. And um, the thing that spurred this was, I was meeting a whole lot of people in Europe last year and thought I should really like find a way to just like note down who's in what country in case I go back there. And then next week I'm off to Sydney, the week after that I'm off to Brisbane and that sort of kind of spurred me again to be like, all right, who's in Sydney, who's in Brisbane? Touch base with them. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. So it's such a, such a simple thing that you can do but it makes such a difference if you want to check back in six months' time and be like, oh, I haven't talked to this person in a while. For sure. And mm. and people will naturally think of you more and more the more you're in contact with them. Now, I'm not saying hit them up every single day but if it's mm. every two months or three months, all of a sudden they go, hey, Ruben, I know Ruben wants to work in the US. All these opportunities are coming up and they, you know, the reality is it's mm. a small industry and you know, across the board and they're going to be like, hey, Hey, do you know anybody? And I'll be like, hey, I know Ruben wants to get over here as well. All of a sudden, Ruben's getting first look at the job mm. before anybody else. And mm. it's because you've shown that you're interested and you're interested in people um, and that you're interested in getting over here and you'll do whatever it takes. Mm. All of a sudden, that wasn't something that popped up yesterday. You guys have been talking about this for the last six to 12 months mm. and your first first cab off the rank in their head to go, hey, I've got to send this one over to Ruben, so for yeah. sure. Mm. That literally happened to a, a girl called Paris who I was chatting to during the week. She's from Perth. She now works for the Chelsea Football Club in Incredible. London. Incredible. And uh, I had a Zoom call with her and she said that for 12 months in the lead up to moving to London, she was networking with EPL clubs. Mm -hmm. She gets to London. Within three weeks, she's got a job at a top tier EPL club. Yeah, and you compare that to like a lot of other people who just, you know, struggle and job hunt and move from house to house and you know living in london can burn you out and send you back home within six months 
It's a it's an incredible safety net. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it's it's not a traditional pathway. You know, the 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 days of just oh seeing a job ad and throwing you know a resume in. There's so many people doing that. So how do you differentiate yourself? And a lot of that is through networking, is what I always say, and and just being a good human being. To be honest, you know, some people will have conversations with people and try and network with them just to benefit themselves. But you show a genuine interest in people as well. One, they may not be able to help you with a job, but they'll help you with some pretty good advice, whether that's personal or professional. And mm. I think that's the thing I value the most. Like I look at my uh, connections now, all the connections I made through COVID, I talk to a lot of them still and they're mentors to me and they're mentors to me, not just professionally, but personally as well. And managing work-life balance and all that stuff and that age old, you know, test to do so. Mm. But just in general on, hey, how, how is life going? And for a lot of these people, I know the names of their kids. I know, you know, what obviously what part of the US they're in when they're going on holidays. It's just they're friends now and that's the reality. So I selfishly feel like, hey, they help me with their mentorship and guidance in getting to the US. But now they help me with actually just life and being a good friend. So for mm. me, I just I just see it as a win-win situation. Mm. When, when you flew around the US, that created an incredible example of what you're prepared to do. Did you mention that in your interview with ASM Global? Yeah, I, um, well, not necessarily with ASM. Um, I think more people just knew it. They just knew what my desire was. Um, with ASM, I think for me, it was always sort of focused in terms of, you know, when I was in Hong Kong, that was always a starting discussion point for sure that, you know, I want to get to the US eventually. Um, when it was you know, sort of coming up for the Everbank Stadium role, a lot of people at ASM Global knew it because they were part of the family. They knew what the end goal was and it was always a discussion of going to Hong Kong to get to the US. And again, albeit that plan sort of changed a little bit because the plan was always to finish up in Hong Kong. But once sort of that family side of things took advantage and obviously the job popping up, they knew. And again, that's my point to a little bit earlier on. It's not that this popped up overnight and I was just talking about it overnight. This was years and years and years. So for people in the back of their mind, they knew that I wanted to get to the US eventually. So for me, it was almost one of those things you didn't even have to mention because they mm. knew it was public knowledge, do you know what I mean? Mm. So um, again, doesn't hurt to always reiterate it, but again, I think you sort of demonstrated in the way you interview and you discuss things as well that, hey, this is a passion and it's definitely the direction I want to go in. Mm. I think like some people think, you know, when they're networking, it's like it's about the person in front of you that can get them a job, but it's the, the network effect of that. Sure. You can go and tell your mate that you met Rubes and he's interested in this and I've got the perfect candidate oh, for you for and sure. that's how it starts. Like think about it as the wider net. You know, it's not just the, the one individual in front of you that can, that can help. Absolutely and that's what it is and a lot of the work's done before you even get in that interview, you know, in, interview room. Like you have, when you get into that interview room, you've probably got two or three people that have already vouched for you and the work's for you almost like, you know, to put the icing on the cake is the way I used to, mm. you know, say it because... The people that are interviewing you have already had, hey, this one's a good one, keep an eye on them. And they've probably already got this preconceived idea of, hey, you know, we've got two or three people advocating for him already. Let's just make sure that he, he can present to us. And then if that's the case, then it's generally a, a positive direction forward. I love that. I love your approach to all that. And it's, it's turned out very well for you. Um, I want to talk about your experience working at NFL Games. And uh, when you were back at Marvel, Primarily the events you're looking after, AFL matches week to week. Now you're at a NFL stadium managing NFL games. How do they compare? Like what, what are the similarities from AFL to NFL games and what, what's vastly different between AFL and NFL? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, the AFL is an exceptionally professional environment. I want to make sure that doesn't get misconstrued at any stage. They are doing incredible things here in Australia. The NFL is a global business. I mean, we've just seen them expand into Spain. Um, they're obviously expanding into Brazil. They're in Germany. Mexico City and obviously um, the UK. I think it's just the level of, I don't want to say professionalism, but the level of the amount of attention it's getting, right? So if you look at an AFL game at Marvel, you've got 50,000 people in the building still, but you don't have the likes of the counterterrorism and the bomb squad at the games, where for us we do. You know, NFL games, you have everybody that is anybody across the board at the stadium ready to go should something happen. So I think it's just because the global exposure, you know, you look at things like... This year we hosted um, the Cincinnati Bengals on Monday night football um, and the Baltimore Ravens on Sunday night football. You've got all of America and the world watching that one game. You are the only time slot. So just making sure that you've got everything that's ready to be activated. And again, the second part to it, aside from safety and security, is probably the broadcast side of things. It is huge. It's a monster. Um, I'm so grateful. I've got a sensational team in, in, in Jacksonville that, you know, they you pretty much look after broadcast as if it's its own event. 
you know, you've got ESPN, you've got Fox, whoever it may be coming in. They are a big beast and you just see the number of camera positions, you see the sideline cameras, the amount of <laughs> effort that needs to go into it. Um, it's pretty mind-blowing just to see how much effort goes into it in comparison to, you know, you know Friday night football here in, in Australia. But um, I think, again, the fundamentals are all very similar, really, really similar. And, again, that's one thing that really stood out for me. The planning stages are really similar, the level of professionalism, whether it's from the NFL and the AFL, um, really similar, you know, the attention to security and safety of the fans and patrons is is really, really similar too. And, you know, the professionalism of the teams, it's just, you know, I look at some of the teams that I used to look after in at Marvel, you know, it's Saints, Doggies, um, Essendon. They're big teams, especially the Bombers. Like they're a big team, but the Jags, you know, the Jags are not the biggest NFL team, but they're, they're still an NFL team. Their team is huge, you know what I mean? Like so you got the similarities of, you know, big teams, big clubs, but just the amount of people that work for those companies and the level of complexities and the level of dollars that are into it, that's probably the major difference as well. Mm. Are the, the demands of the teams different? You know, I'm sure there's probably people you know, ringing up 24-7. You know, is that different compared to the environment that you came from? I've got to be careful what I say here, don't I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I, I love my Jags. I love my Jags. They, they are, um, they're an incredible team. But yes, like, yeah, there's naturally more, more on the line, right? And um, I actually love that side of it. That's my favourite part of the job is the relationship side of things. So being able to deliver for your tenant, I think, is ultimately one of the, the biggest goals for any venue operator or manager, whether it's Live Nation or AG or Frontier Touring in, in Australia or um, similar similar players in the US or it's the NFL team or the AFL team. Like you just want to make sure their day is actually extra special and the way their business operates is extra special. So whether that's helping them generate additional revenues or saying yes to more things than no, um, I definitely enjoy that as well because you want what's best for your tenant always. And um, I learned that pretty quickly. Um, you know, I'm not one that says no straight off the bat. I'll always try and make it a yes until it's a no. And that's not because I want to be a yes man. It's because you want to maximize the benefit of the team and just show that, you know, although you wear, you know, a different uniform and, you know, somebody else pays your wages, you're one on the same team. You know, that's the reality. You know, if the team wins, whether it's the Jags or um, Live Nation or whether it's, you know, AEG or Frontier Touring in Australia and or the Saints or the Doggies or whoever it is, you're all on the same team. You know, if they win, you win. And that's the, that's the truth without any, too much corniness. How did you feel knowing that you had the bomb squad, the FBI, all this incredibly high level of security like suddenly at your disposal? Was that something that you were accustomed to in Australia or was it suddenly like, hey, E-Ray, here's like all the power in the world to make sure that this thing goes to plan? Yeah, no, I think it's just it just shows how, um, you know, these buildings are really just invested into public safety. And it was the same in Australia, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, you look at the resources that Victoria Police used to provide at, you know, Marvel as well. Like everybody is so invested in public safety. Like there is no ifs or buts about it. And I think for me, it's just, it's a safety net. You know, you look at it and you go, hey, these guys are as serious about it all as I am. And again, nobody takes a shortcut with any of it. Everybody is so invested in making sure that, you know, people that are coming to our event, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in Hong Kong, whether it's in the US, that everybody gets in, has a good time and gets home safely. And, you know, for the people that are out there that, you know, do have ill intents towards these events that, you know, there's going to be, you know, repercussions obviously after the math, but there are people there to quickly respond and, you know, make them think twice as well. So I think for me, it was just more so that comfort and that safety net more so than anything. But, never have taken anything for granted as well, whether it's in Australia or in the US. The work that these groups and entities do is truly the the real award-winning stuff and serious stuff. And for us, we just help, you know, put all the players in the one room and make sure we're all swimming in the same direction, which we always are. We know events are sometimes challenging, doesn't always go to plan. Um, and you've had plenty of experience uh, running events. I'm keen to understand what's the most challenging situation you've been under uh, as a venue manager? Uh, you know, when I thought about this one, there was a few and I could naturally go to ones where, you know, the game nearly gets delayed or cancelled or um, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, they're generally terrorism related or, you know, anti-terrorism related or gas leaks or something like that, you know, system failures or whatever it may be. But I remember one thing for sure and um, I'm going to flick back to my Marvel days and it was a Foo Fighters concert. And for those that I'm not sure if they've been there or were there for this one, I think it was in 2017 or 2018, um, we had our queuing infrastructure, you know, we'd, we'd used the similar queuing infrastructure in the way to get people in previously and it worked a treat. Sometimes things that you've done previously just don't work. And 
for a lot of people what they have this expectation as venue managers is that everything always works perfectly. Mate, we're swans. We are like swimming with unbelievable pace underwater but above it looks like everything's working well. And <laughs> it was a few fighters concert and um, it was out at, at Gate 7 so that would oh, – jeez, I've lost my touch on north and south at Marvel <laughs> Stadium now. But, you know, it was out at Gate 7, big gate. You've got people lining up and – we soon worked out that people were sort of not moving through the queuing infrastructure very quickly. And when you notice that, there's not a whole lot you can do. And why I say that is because you can't have people moving bike rack around and it just makes it really messy. And um, I remember it, it spilt out outside of the queuing of Marvel and, and straight up the road. And, and um, I am naturally one when things are going wrong, I don't just shy away, I sort of just own it, I'm in the face of it and I popped out to gate seven and I'm walking through and I have never been abused like this in my life. You think of every sort of swear word under the world, I got called it. Like I just, I, I can't even explain it. I've never been abused like that in my life and I, it's hard not to laugh in those scenarios as well. So, um, How old were you at the time? Uh, I would have had to have been... 24, 25 maybe max. 24, 25 just getting abused. Yeah, and I'm trying to like be really positive and proactive and this line is going worse and worse, almost down to I want to say it's almost towards um, Southern Cross Station. Like it's it's gone a long, long way here, new Victoria Police building all the way over there. And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, if I'm giving this love to the people at the the close to the front of the queue, I've got to start wandering down to the back of the end of the queue. Mate, the abuse got worse because they're further away. <laughs> and I just sat back and you look at it and like the, the show was delayed. Um, they came on, I think, 30 minutes late just to make sure everybody got in. But when I say constant abuse for a good hour and a half, that was it. And I just sat there. Oh, I've never been so tired in my life because just to get abused but still be so kind to everybody at the same time, you just sit back and you look at it and you're like, I'm never winning here. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, sorry, guys, bear with us. Bear with. Well, what do you mean, bear with us? Like, and they're just abusing you, no matter what you say. Mm. And and some of their points are valid. I mean, you know, it's almost like you know, a little kid tells you something that you agree with, but you want to tell them off. Like, you can't tell them off because you agree with them. So you're sitting there and they're just <laughs> abusing me. So I, I would say, like, I I look at that as a funny one now, looking back, and you make those changes and those tweaks. But you know, there's naturally that inclination to go towards those real counterterrorism, serious topics. But for me, I look at it and I'm like, venue management is just a laugh. It really is. You've, ha- you've got to have fun otherwise you'll go crazy. And that one will always stick in the back of my mind just purely because of the amount of abuse I got. It was, it was sensational. And <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be matched it ever again. <laughs> were, you, were you tempted to go find a colleague and just be like, hey, can you walk with me just so we can share this? <laughs> you know what? I, I sat there. It was a point where I was like, mate, maybe I should get some security here as well because it was getting quite aggressive. But yeah, it's one of those things where you like, you know, to this day, I don't think anybody knows how bad it was um, or the abuse that was being spat out. And almost mm. to your point, I wish somebody was there with me, whether I had a GoPro on me or something like that, so they could have heard it because mm. it was just, it was sensational. You know, it's it just, it epitomised what Australians can be like at times and how, you know, extensive our derogatory language can be because they called me everything and it wasn't just me, it was my family members and everything like that as <laughs> no. well. So it's, um, it's one of those ones where you sit back and you're like, you know what, they just, they'll come in for a good time. It was a less than great experience. You, you can't get too frustrated by it and you've got to wear your heart on the sleeve and, and that's what they do as Australians. Yeah. Oh, makes for a good story. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. Yeah. Since your time at Marvel, you've now moved into a leadership role. Back at Marvel, I believe you... Had no direct reports but managing a team of casuals, whereas yep. now you've got 45 people underneath you. Yep. How have you found that move into leadership? Yeah, I think, you know, naturally there was the progression at Marvel anyway in general. Um, you know, although indirectly leading a team, you are in that role. You know, everybody indirectly reports to you. So um, for me, it was quite a swimming transition, especially once I moved to Hong Kong as well. Leadership I love and I think for me what I say is leadership is not just in your professional environment, it's how you operate outside of it as well and whether it's um, semi-professional sports or you know um, local football, whatever it may be, you naturally become a leader amongst your mates and that's the reality. Um, now it's just, it's incredible. I love the people aspect of my role. I really do. It's probably one of my favourite pieces because you've got such a variety of people that you work with and diverse, you know, sort of backgrounds you know i've got people that are looking to retire in the next couple of years and i've got people that are really fresh in their career you know five six years younger than me and being able to just 
chop and change what that looks like. People that have been at the stadium probably almost longer than what I've been alive. Like for me, it's just understanding everybody's perspective and guiding them in a direction which really truly helps them for what they want to achieve. That's not just always professional either. For me, it's the personal aspect too, understanding what's happening at home and knowing they have the comfort of coming into my office and saying, hey, I need a couple of days because this is happening at home and knowing that we can quickly shift and pivot to make sure that we can accommodate them so they don't feel this guilt of being away from work. So um, the leadership aspect is is a blessing with the people side, but it's challenging as well. You are the face of a business at time too. So, you know, when things go wrong, it's on you. And I say it all the time, you know, at the end of the day, the buck stops with me on a lot of the things at the stadium. And for me, I always put my hand up and own it. Because if I don't, I mean, I'm never going to put it down to the team because everyone makes mistakes. But the reality is you, you've got to be across a lot. So um, I love it. I really do. I think the leadership's my favourite part of it all and growing and learning. It's helping me become a better person outside of work as well where I definitely always can, you know, put in a lot of work as well. Um, but showing that compassion, that patience because it's crazy when you do the comparison. You know, I look at my partner and I think she's the most, you know, I'm, I'm the least patient with her because she's the closest to me, right? And then you look at how patient you can be with your staff members as well and you sit back and you reflect and you're like, hey, there's no reason why I can't adopt that into my personal life too and it makes you really cognizant of it. So I'm loving that side of it all and, and I just can't wait to continue growing it and differing personalities and, you know, different experiences and different responsibilities and, um, you know, no people are really too similar and, I, and that's what I love as well. Everyone's got a different journey and a different story and, you know, some of them make um, better fun of my Australian <laughs> accent than others, and uh, I love it. I love I love hearing the banter and the comfort of them being able to have that banter with me. Are, are there any particular experiences, mentors, books, resources that have helped you with that leadership skill? Because, for example, there there are some people who are so good at what they do. They might be a specialist lawyer. They then get promoted to managing a team of lawyers, which is an entirely new skill set, and they might not be suited to that they might have just have been the best lawyer. So what, what's kind of helped you, um, you know, adopt this leadership skill? I think it's just knowing, you know, I, I flip back to how we met Ruben, the, the mental health space. Mm. And, and, and I want to go back there because I think that's what helped me as well is everybody's journey is really different. You don't know what people are operating in, in the personal lives. And that's the truth. So I think for me that really helped understand the compassion side of things and the perspective of things and, when you look at mentorship, I, I keep referring to Leonard Bernacci, who's our regional vice president, who was a big reason why I'm in the US. You know, I've worked with him now on a couple other projects aside from Everbank. And what I always say to him is this guy worked at the Philadelphia Eagles for like 17 years. He should know a lot of it. He's run stadiums all around the world. We were in St. Louis together and I said to him, you know, my greatest piece of feedback for you is you've done so much, but you're still willing to listen to me. Like there was a couple of things we don't agree on, but we communicate and he's like, mate, that's absolutely right. And for me, I was like, oh, he has every right to turn around and say, no, nah, you know what? You're not right. We should be doing it this way. And by, you know, default of respect, you turn around and go, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I'll listen to that. But being able to still remain compassionate and understanding that, like, hey, although I've done it in this business for quite a substantial period of time, I'm still willing to learn how things can be done in a new way as well. So for me, I always just keep that open mind on things. I don't know it all. And you know, whether it's your role, your responsibility, your leadership position, it doesn't mean that you can't receive feedback from other people as well. So I think for me, it's just understanding the people side of things and, and having mentors that are always willing to listen, you know, and they've got 30, 40, 50 years of, of experience. So it helps shape my future for sure. Mm. Love it. This has been a really good chat. We could probably have a third episode you know, <laughs> in, in a few years just to <laughs> yeah. see where you've ended up. The rate you're going, there'll be a third. Yeah, there'll be in Brazil by that time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, the last one I've got for, for you is if you were speaking to someone who is interested in venue management or a stadium nerd, as, as you put it, I kind of like that. What is one thing, one action they can be doing to sort of get into the space and, and get started? Networking. Simple as that. You know, network, grab coffees with people. Um, if you can't grab a coffee, try and grab a call with them, Zoom, whatever it may be. Just research and learn. Um, it's a cool business. I think it's one of the most incredible jobs in the world and I'm biased because I live and breathe it, but it really is. I mean, I just refer back, reflect back to that ability to positively impact so many people's lives at once and um, just network, network. You'll learn a lot of it. A lot of this job is all about character. They can teach you the job, but it's all about the character and your willingness to, to show that work ethic and, and resilience to get there. And 
you know, there's benefits for it professionally, but definitely benefits for it personally as well in your, in your everyday life. Fantastic. Network. Done. Network. <laughs> Keyword. Before we uh, wrap, any other episodes relating to stadiums or... You know, E Ray's past episode that people can listen yeah, to. Yeah, well, E Ray's history you'll find in episode 41 way back in 2020. Wow. I think we had OG the days. Our very OG, OG days. days. Yeah. Oh, yes. We're over two, that was like 230 episodes ago now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I feel privileged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, and uh, another venue manager who we've had on the show is a guy called Kerry Gassner. Do you know him? I know Kerry very well. Perfect. Yeah, I know Kerry very well. <laughs> He came on in episode 206, I reckon, and he is the venue manager of John Kane Arena where you find the NBL, ten, uh, the Australian Open, Barack Obama even ventured there yeah. recently. Jeez, so it's a nice one. And um, he's come from the world of policing, so interesting career transition for him too. So a couple of other episodes people might enjoy. Nice. A yeah. few, few podcast Hall of Famers. The, the event manager space. So yeah. you, you're in it, obviously, because oh, you, you've had a double episode. Well, they're, they're such cool and calm heads. Yeah. yeah. You've got to be. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah, have to yeah. be. You have to be. Yeah. Although my wife probably says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> that's home life, so it's different. Yeah. 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 Mate, it is, uh, it's been awesome having you back and uh, it's just amazing to hear your your job and what you get up to. You should be, you know, you're extremely lucky and I'm sure a lot of people listening in are, Absolutely keen to follow in your footsteps because it sounds like an amazing, amazing life you're living over there and um, we're just lucky to have you back on. So thanks a lot for coming in and uh, we'll see you when we're over in the US at some point, uh, unsure when, but we'll make sure we let you know. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> well, we've, we've been talking to our other NFL mate, which is uh, Michael Wolfert. And uh, he works at the New Orleans team. I forget what they're called. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Saints. Saints. New Orleans Saints. Yeah. yeah. So there's been a bit of discussion about next year's Super Bowl. So um, mm. it's an ASM building, that one as well. Oh, well, there, there we go. go. There you Maybe go. we should. We, we might see there. Bring me right. <laughs> yeah. uh, get me busy. Get yeah. me involved. Yeah, yeah. Jacksonville we'll could be in it, so yeah. that could add a bit of something to it as well. They're coming. Absolutely. Keep your eye on the Jags. Yeah, they're coming. Right. Thanks, right. mate. Thank you, guys. Take care. Guys, it is time now for the people's segment of the podcast, Ask Sports Grab, where every week we answer a question directly from our community. If you'd like to ask a question, we mentioned at the top of the episode, May 14 is the time where you can become a Sports Grab member. Head to our website, join our wait list, and join on May 14. It's going to be a huge, huge day. You can join our Discord and ask any question you have about the sports industry. Rubes, this one comes from Nick, and he says... Do you have any advice on how to make a cover letter stand out? I feel as though mine has become quite repetitive. Mm. Great question, Nick. And um, if you are submitting the same cover letter each time, then uh, it's probably time to change that. So uh, in principle, the easiest way to stand out is to do things that other people aren't prepared to do. And if you are applying to hundreds of jobs, not everyone is prepared to tailor hundreds of cover letters. Um, but it's very important because unless every single job is exactly the same, then your cover letter should be different. So I would stop copy pasting the ones that you're sending out at the moment and start getting used to tailoring your cover letter. So the way that I write my cover letter is rather than try and tick every single box that the job description wants me to tick, because sometimes I can ask for about 30 different things that you need to be able to do. Just focus on the top three. And the way that you find the top three is by dissecting the job description and literally just taking note of like how many times has a particular skill or task been mentioned. You've got to use your own judgment to make a call on what is the the priority of tasks. And then I would find out what are my top three experiences for, sorry, what is my number one experience for each of those top three tasks? And then I'd write a paragraph about how I've demonstrated that task in another setting. And I'd go into detail about, you know, what was the context, what was my role, what action did I take, um, and what was the result of that as well, rather than just quickly glossing over like, yes, I've managed projects in the past. Yeah. Like, right, well, cool. How should, did I, you should I just believe you? Or <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So um, you could say you did anything. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. So the first thing I'll do to stand out is actually – dissect the job description and then tailor your resume based on the tasks that he's looking for. The second thing I would do is uh, tell a story about why you want to work in sport. So use an introduction paragraph to articulate, you know, sport is meaningful to me because of X, Y, and Z. Um, When we had Kimberly Finesse on the podcast in episode 128, the title is literally how to write your cover letter. And she goes into great detail Mm. in that episode about some of the cover letters that she's received. She's the general manager of people and culture at Netball Australia. 
but previously was a people and culture manager at Cricket Australia. And she said the resume, the, sorry, the cover letter that she'll never forget at Cricket started with, I'm going to tell you why I deserve to wear the bag- baggy green. And that person went on to get the job. So tailor your, re- your cover letter every single time. It should never feel like it's getting repetitive because you should never be copying and pasting out to every single job because every job is different. And um, a second way is to start to tell a story around your connection to sport. Nice. Don't be afraid to show your personality mm. in that opening paragraph because that's what's going to jump out of the page, right? Yep. Fantastic. Well, if you'd like to ask us a question or ask our friends in sport a question, sign up and become a Sports Grade member on May 14th. Being a member gives you access to a network in sport, fortnightly events, career resources, exclusive job boards, and all of our meetup events for free. So get involved, join our waitlist now so you don't miss out on becoming a member. In the meantime, find us on LinkedIn. Give us some love with a rating if you enjoy the show. Send it to your mates. Subscribe on Apple and follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey, friends. One last thing before you go. If you really want to make an impact in sport, then subscribe to the Sports Grad newsletter. Inside, we share all the latest job openings and networking events, so you're always aware of opportunities to land a job and grow your network. Plus, we share a Q&A with professional on how they grow their career in sport. Here, we talk about things like how they moved overseas or negotiated their salary or landed a new job or promotion, made a career change, and so much more. It's kind of like a little boost of inspiration in your inbox before the weekend. So if you're like us, you're career driven and you're keen to progress quickly, you're going to love the Sportsgrad newsletter. To get it, head to sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe or follow the link in the show notes. See you next time.